Welcome back, AP. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of the expansion of the Napoleonic domain, right? Well, not the Napoleonic domain quite yet. We're going to be getting into that a little bit later in this flip, right? But the last place that we left off on in class, so we're talking about Napoleon Bonaparte and the fact that he has now created himself as the first consul of France, right? He overthrows the directory in the Council of 500 and his coup d'etat of 1799, and he begins to rise in prominence as the one supreme leader of France. Now, early on, as we know, he's still keeping that Republican imagery and stuff like that. He's literally using something drawn directly from ancient Rome. The, the role of a consul is actually that of an ancient Roman government governing official. And they, of course, are the first ones that actually invented that concept of a republic. So when we're actually looking at Napoleon early on, he's really trying his best to keep up those traditions of France. Really, really love that y'all are understanding all this really well. Really love that y'all are actually keeping up with the speed of what we're talking about this as well as. And like, remember, keep in mind when you're studying for this test, not the nitty gritty stuff. Don't worry too much about the fact that Charles Talleyrand had a limp. Just know who he was, right? That chameleon, the guy in the background, the master of puppets, if you will, Metallica reference. Uh, that, like, of course, going into the, all the like different phases of the French Revolution. And of course, we're now at the fourth phase of the French Revolution. We are full force in the Napoleonic phase, right? So the thing we need to understand, though, is that after Napoleon's rise to power, he is going to do one of his first things that he does as first consul of France. Uh, he is going to try and reclaim some Italian lands across the Alps, right? Now, the Alps, just so you know, is a massive, very, very treacherous mountain range, okay? That, of course, is in northern Italy. And what I mean by reclaimed is y'all should remember that, like, after the whiff of Grape Shot event, after he earned the trust of the directory following the fall of the Committee of Public Safety in the day. I will call you back, Mama. But, so... Hey, Mama. Yeah, I'm flipping right now. Can I call you right back? All right. I love you. Bye. Sorry about that, but anyway, getting back into it. The big thing about it, though, that we were talking about is after he earns the trusted directory following the committee of, the committee of public safety and the death of Rose here, he is going to actually lose some of that land in northern Italy, right? He went back over there and like claimed like $57 million in loot and art and stuff like that away from the Austrians. Well, in his process of trying to invade Egypt and then also overthrowing the government, they kind of the Austrians took that land back. So he goes back over there and he fights in this thing known as the Battle of Marengo, right? He crosses the entirety of the Alps with a massive French military force and has a triumphant victory at the the Battle of Marengo, further cementing his powerful role in France, right? Because it's going to earn himself some good rep, right? Some good reputation as being a great military leader and then also now the new leader of state. Now, the Battle of Marengo, though, also kind of prov provides us with a very, very good instance of Napoleon's mastering of propaganda. Now, a lot of this might have had to do with Charles Talleyrand, right? Because he was actually one of Napoleon's closest advisors and ministers of state. So a lot of this might have had to do with his intervention. But when we look at this, like these two pieces, of propaganda that actually are being compared directly next to each other when we're talking about the crossing of the Alps and the Battle of Marengo. Uh, we've got one that is an exactly very positive image of Napoleon, right? That one right there. That, of course, being a very famous piece by Jacques-Louis David, the same guy that did the death of Marat, painted this piece and also became Napoleon's royal court painter, right? Did all of his portraits of him and stuff like that to make him look triumphant and magnificent. When we're looking at Napoleon, notice a couple of things about it. First and foremost, he's wearing a, like a tricolor cockade, the symbol of the revolution, showing that he still, of course, supports it. He's atop his magnificent steed, Marengo. He actually named this horse Marengo after the victory at the Battle of Marengo. And fun fact, there's a Marengo Street in New Orleans named after him directly. And then also, you see in the background, the French soldiers moving artillery and like all this different equipment up the Alps as as they cross this massive mountain range. And he shows his victory above the Alps as he's inscribed his name on top of them, Bonaparte. Across the faded other names, you've got Hannibal right there, who's the guy Hannibal Barca, who took elephants across the Alps to invade Rome. And you've got Carlos Magnus right there, being Charlemagne, who actually also crossed the Alps to go and protect the Pope during the Middle Ages, right? So he's cementing himself in there with the military traditions of the great Hannibal and the great Charlemagne, okay? That is a positive piece of propaganda. This one, on the other hand, uh, like, though was done by a French painter inside of the empire that shows in reality if he was crossing the Alps he would have been really cold it would have been really treacherous and he probably would have done it on a mule not on a horse because a mule can survive it whereas a horse probably won't so the thing that we're looking at right now with these two images is just bear in mind 
Not everybody liked Napoleon, right? Bear in mind that not everybody was one of his supporters, okay? That he was very good at mastering the art of propaganda to grow his reputation and earn even more favor. But there were still some people that actually really, really didn't like him that much. Now, from 1800 to 1801, following the Battle of Marengo, he's going to do a lot of different initiatives that are going to further cement him as the ruler of France, right? First of all, the economy is going to begin to stabilize, following, of course, the terrible intervention of the Committee of Public Safety and, of course, that plan to emergency social economy that they were using, right? Remember that bread of equality that actually caused more scarcity because they didn't have enough wheat to actually back that price, right? So he begins to help stabilize the economy, right? He creates a treaty also with the British, which is very surprising of Napoleon because... You don't see that coming from this guy, right? A treaty with the British. I thought this guy hated the British, okay? Well, he creates a treaty with the British so he can actually focus on French affairs of state and actually focus on creating an empire that he thinks is worthy of his, like, a ruling ability, right? So he does that so he can stop fighting so many large-scale wars. Now, the other thing that happens is the Concordat of Bologna of 1801. Now, some of y'all probably remember we've talked about the Concordat of Bologna of 1516 before, which is back in the day when Francis I of France signed the Concordat of Bologna with the Pope, allowing him to appoint his own bishops and stuff like that because he wanted to pick French ones, okay? And that's going to prevent them from actually falling subject to the Reformation when it actually breaks out underneath Luther and Charles, and underneath Luther inside the Holy Roman Empire. Well, there's going to be a new version of the Concordat of Bologna, and this one's going to come out in 1801. Notice I have a bunch of stars next to it because it is really, really important. A lot of times they like to ask about this on the AP test, but the Concordat of Bologna is actually the measure that Napoleon took when he actually created a new treaty with the Catholic Church and a new treaty with the Pope, with the Pope bringing the Catholic Church back into France, right? Because as we probably remember during the Reign of Terror, Maximilien Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety got rid of Catholicism full sail in France. What they're going to end up doing is they actually create this new religion called like the Cult of the Supreme Being. They close Notre Dame. They actually turned Notre Dame, or their plan was to turn Notre Dame into like a flea market at one point, basically turn it into a shopping mall because they were like, oh, we don't really need a church anymore because we're kind of getting rid of Christianity because they de-Christianized France. Well, the thing about Napoleon, though, is he's going to actually sign a treaty with the Pope saying that the like Catholic Church is coming back to France, right? That it will become the majority religion of France once again, and that it will actually also kind of just like mediate the state between French politics, the French government, and also the Catholic Church as well. So it's that reintroduction of the Catholic faith in back into French society. That's going to be really, really important also because it's just going to kind of uphold some of the old French traditional values. And we'll talk a little bit more about it in class, but highlight it, star it. It is going to be a really important concept. But in 1802, another big thing is going to happen where Napoleon would actually become so popular that he would be elected first consul for life. Now, why is this happening? And a lot of it has to do with, again, one, rigged elections, and two, this the kind of stabilization of France, okay? So you got to remember something really important, whereas the reign of terror was so chaotic and the directory was very placid and didn't have a lot of stuff going for it, Napoleon's going to go come in and he's going to create a French state that actually mediates the values between the French Revolution of having equality for most people and then also with the growing of the French like reputation and military. Since he's winning so many battles and wars and then also since he's holding up a lot of the values of the revolution, the people are beginning to kind of really, really love him. Now, if we could go back and have an election to see if he actually would be elected first consul of life, I'd love to see it without the fake and rigged ones and stuff like that. Uh, but we just don't really know, right? But we do know that most, by and large, most French people super heavily supported him. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that he did a lot of different things during this process, right? From the years of about, like, 1800 to about 1803, he's going to focus on, like, some really big initiatives, right? For example, he's going to sell the Louisiana Territory for $15 million to the United States of America in 1803. Now, interesting little fact, though, here. Charles Talleyrand hated this idea, right? Like he hated this idea and he actually argued against it. He said one day when we actually find something that will grow there and actually find some, like we're giving up massive amounts of land because if any of y'all have ever actually taken the time to look at a map of the Louisiana Purchase, it's wild how much of our country we actually bought for a measly $15 million, right? That's pennies on the acre. Like if you zoom in right here, you can see that's a huge swath. It's like a third of the continental United States that Napoleon sells to us for 
for 15 million bucks? Like, that's crazy, right? So the thing about it, though, also, is Talleyrand was heavily against it, but Napoleon's beginning to try and do something. He's trying to earn as much finances as he can because he's going to start going to war. Now, this is an interesting, pivotal moment in his reign, right, where he actually came to power, was elected first consul of life, for life, and he's going to begin to start doing some things because he's not satisfied with just ruling over France, right? He's going to start getting really foolhardy and start getting really full of himself, and that's going to become very, very emblematic during the wars that he's going to fight. Another big thing that he does as well is he reinstates slavery in Saint-Domingue. Now, Saint-Domingue is that colony that revolted against France, okay, underneath the leadership of that guy named Toussaint L'Overture. He was a former, like, slave, and he, of course, like, fought to actually liberate, or, like, to end slavery in what is now modern-day Haiti. And, of course, the British and the French, are, or British and the Spanish are going to, like, make him an officer in their armies, hoping that they'll get the colony if they actually do liberate the entirety of it. But, of course, Robespierre, in slavery, in that area, to keep Toussaint L'Overture on the side of France, right? Well, Napoleon, being the dastardly guy that he is, actually set a trap for Toussaint L'Overture, had him arrested, had him brought into the French Alps, and had him locked up until the day he died. And what's going to end up happening is he actually tries to reinstate slavery, inspiring another popular revolt that eventually revolts, and they actually end up losing the colony of Saint-Domingue permanently. Why would he do this? Because they were producing like 60% of the world's sugar and like 40% of the world's coffee by that point, right? So he wanted to reinstate slavery so it could become even more profitable. And he also writes this thing called the Napoleonic Code. Now, these two things right here are for finances, right? He's trying to make a lot of money, mostly because he's trying to finance a large military because he's about to go into a set of large-scale wars that we'll talk about here in about like two seconds. Seconds, okay. Well, he also though is going to write the Napoleonic Code. Now, the Napoleonic Code is a super important like vessel of law and justice that is going to be created underneath Napoleon's rule, right? So the Napoleonic Code was a concept that he wanted to get rid of these old things called the customs, right? Customs were these old laws that were on the books in France, and they kind of changed from region to region of France with no real consistency, and they were full of loopholes, right? Loopholes for the rich, so they didn't have to actually be charged with crimes. Loopholes for other people, so they didn't have to be executed. Loopholes for styles of executions and things like that. The thing about the customs, though, was that they were by nature non-revolutionary and non-enlightenment documents because they didn't apply to everyone equally. Well, enter in Napoleon, who with a very large contingent of his chief ministers and then also Talleyrand by his side, they decide to actually write this thing called the Napoleonic Code, which will be a unifying document and a code of law that will actually put all of the law codes in France into one seminal tome, and they will be actually applied throughout the entirety of France equally, right? Now, the thing that's on the positive end of the Napoleonic Code is it reinstated the values of the revolution itself, right? It gave more liberty to men, more equality to men, more right over their property, and more, like, kind of rights, like, abridged over classes, right? If you murdered somebody, everyone's going to be charged the same, right? It's also going to kind of define property ownership, and then also, as well, really, really begin to divine and uh, define and outline the ideas of the new French revolutionary man. Now, notice I'm saying man a lot. Something we need to understand very, very uniformly about the Napoleonic Code is its giant negative is it's going to actually basically strip women of all of the rights that they earned during the revolution. They are not going to be giving the right to divorce of their, of their husbands anymore. They're not allowed to handle money whatsoever anymore. And it's going to basically set them back about like 50 years forward before to what it was like to be a woman before the revolution ever even happened. And another thing about it as well is it's all these new rights and laws are going to apply to white French men, right? And not to people of color and not to other minorities. And especially it's going to try and reinstate slavery in those different colonies. So so the thing that we need to understand about the Napoleonic Code is that it was good in one sense and then a massive step backwards in another. And fun fact, the Law Code of Louisiana is based off the Napoleonic Code, right? Not all of the sexist parts of it and stuff like that, but more along the lines of, like, literally, we use the Napoleonic Code in Louisiana as the basis of law code in only Louisiana and the other states all use common law, which is actually kind of an interesting little fact. Now, the Napoleonic Code, though, we'll talk about a little bit in class as well, so leave like a line underneath it, just sort of a little bit of extra expansion. Now, what's going to end up going down, though, in the next phase of the Napoleonic Empire is going to be the thing that really throws Talleyrand off the wagon, and it kind of disintegrates their relationship between Talleyrand and Napoleon, and it kind of begs the question for a lot of historians, is would Napoleon have ever fallen like he did 
if Talleyrand was still by his side, because we don't really know, but Talleyrand was that master politician that was really, really good at puppeteering everything from behind the curtains, right? Now, after the assass after an assassination attempt, because again, remember, not everybody loved Napoleon, right? So somebody tried to assassinate him actually in 1804, and he's going to popularize, or excuse me, catapult himself off the popular press that comes out because people are being like, oh, someone disgustingly tried to murder our first consul, our true leader, Napoleon Bonaparte, and he's gonna be like yeah they did and what he's gonna do is he's gonna hold another plebiscite and he's gonna declare himself the emperor of france in january of 1804 right before he actually publishes the napoleonic code which will give even more rights to people under this new emperor role right so you see he's very very strategic about this and all of these were a lot of talleyrand ideas but then when he tries to expand this new empire that's where talleyrand and him begin to fall out now, the thing about it, though, is Napoleon like declares himself the emperor of France, and he holds a plebiscite yet again to have a vote set on it, and 99% apparently of French revolutionary citizens voted that they wanted him to be the emperor of this new French empire, right? Well, the thing about it, though, is in 1804, if you're going to be having yourself an empire, you got to be growing and expanding. And also, this is a fun little scene to kind of talk about him actually growing himself as the emperor of France. He actually got called Pope Pius VII, the guy that he actually signed the Concordat of Bologna with, the Pope at the time. He actually calls him to Notre Dame to actually be there to help bless the entire ceremony and then actually to put the crown on top of Napoleon's head. Now, interesting little fact, though, is when Napoleon actually walked into Notre Dame to be crowned Emperor of France by the Pope, trying to signal a unification yet again between the Catholic Church and then also this new French Empire, he actually was already wearing a hat. He was wearing a laurel wreath, right, much like Julius Caesar would have worn, and also, again, invoking that Roman imagery of the old Republic, right? He's already wearing a laurel wreath, as you can actually see it right there on his head, and Pope Pius VII actually goes to place yet another crown on top of his head, and then Napoleon's stands up, pulls the crown out of Pope Pius' head, and turns around and goes to place it on top of his wife Josephine's head, right? Again, just trying to show his dominance over the French state and how literally he still believes that the Catholic Church is subversive to him as this new emperor of France, right? So the thing about it that we need to understand as well, he's also married to this woman, Josephine. They've been married since 1797. They actually got married in a civil ceremony for quite some or quite some time. They're not going to stay married for much longer, though. Also, fun fact, Josephine is taller than him. It's another reason why the British made fun of him. And also, they never were able to have kids. Now, Josephine did have children over her own before she met Napoleon. Her husband was actually in the military and died. And so like Napoleon's going to have stepdaughters and step like children. Uh, interesting little weird fact is he forced a couple of his stepdaughters to actually marry his brothers, which is really gross because the age gap was like huge and it's kind of nasty, bro. Like, why'd you do that? Like, so like now the other thing that's going to happen though, is in this moment, he's going to cement himself as the new emperor of France, right? And he's going to begin also about a year before this ever happens, a series of things known as the Napoleonic Wars. And of course, as well as we've got all these Jacques Louis David paintings of our like emperor now of Napoleon, very magnanimously ruling over the French people, right? Now going into it though, the Napoleonic Wars are going to be a really intense set of wars that are going to cause millions of deaths throughout the entirety of the continent of Europe. And it's also going to lead to a very interesting point in history where France is going to basically try to copy and paste its culture over the entire continent, right? And I'm not trying to undersell this whatsoever, but it's absolutely wild to think but the fact that Napoleon led a brand new revolutionary army and y'all, he took over like 85% of the continent of Europe. It's crazy, okay? Because from 1803 to 1812, Napoleon is going to set out to try and conquer and conquest and destroy every coalition force that threatened his empire. Because remember, the coalitions have been fighting against France to try and stop the revolution and actually also make them pay up for killing Louis and Marie Antoinette and kind of destroying the monarchy that existed in France beforehand. So from 1803 to 1812, Napoleon, now upset about this whole thing, is going to wage war against people like Prussia, Austria, Russia, and anybody else in between. Now he also hates England and he was going to reignite that war there as well, but he never really gets their goat ever because they stay out in the water and they're like, meh, heh, 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 like little rubber duckies out there and they're not going to let you touch them, right? So the wars of the third to the sixth coalition are also known as the Napoleonic Wars when Napoleon is leading this conquest over Europe. And y'all, like I said, he took over all of this stuff outlined in red. Nearly 85% of the European continent, including the kingdom of Norway, Denmark, Emperor of the Empire of Austria. He destroys and murders the Holy Roman Empire because he literally like liquidates it down into nothingness. He's the reason why the Netherlands has a king now, which is a whole thing. 
But just to give you an example of why this is such a big deal and how this thing progressed so drastically is you'll notice there's one people he didn't take over, of course, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, right? The thing about it, though, is there's two battles we can talk about really briefly before I let y'all go for the rest of the day, uh, is that kind of will just enigmatically define how he was able to do this, right? Well, we're going to look at two different battles right here. We've got the Battle of Trafalgar, right, and the Battle of Austerlitz, both actually occurring in the year of 1805 during the thick of the Napoleonic Wars, right? Now, the Battle of Trafalgar is the one we'll talk about first, and that was Napoleon's attempt at actually raiding and landing in England and trying to destroy the British Navy and show up and take them over, right, physically. Now, what ends up happening, though, at the Battle of Trafalgar is Napoleon's Navy was decimated. The French Navy actually gets clowned on by the British Navy completely, and of course, who was leading the British Navy at the time? None other than Admiral Horatio Nelson, right? Horatio Nelson, the man that Napoleon could never beat in battle, wrecks and destroys Napoleon's navy using their superior ships of the line and then also more mobile units as well because it just shows that Napoleon was never prepared to fight a naval war against the war or against the navy of the British Empire, right? Now, interestingly enough though, Admiral Horatio though does run out of lives in this battle and he ends up dying. He actually gets shot in the back. We'll talk about that a little bit in class and how it was a crazy whole thing and how he like led for like three hours after after that but what ends up going down though is he loses and now keep this bear this in mind maybe put a little star under this is the French Navy got decimated because the thing about it is he's not gonna he's gonna take decades to rebuild the French Navy even though he's gonna try to blockade Britain later on using what little bit of his navy he had left. And then in 1805, you also have another battle called the Battle of Austerlitz, right? Where Napoleon goes up against the combined forces of Russia, Prussia, and Austria with just the French revolutionary forces and some of the people that he's already taken over. Now, in this battle, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon's army was heavily outnumbered but he still won, and he still won in a commanding victory, right? And the Battle of Austerlitz really, really shows us that Napoleon's forces are almost unstoppable if it's on land, right? Because he actually used mobile artillery units, shock troops is what he called them as well, and, tr and huge battles that include giant movements across the open field. Like lightning quick strikes using overwhelming force and trying to like use the cavalry to split forces into multiple parts and also taking the high grounds, right? Well, the thing about the Battle of Austerlitz, Austerlitz is like we said, a triumphant Napoleon and his smaller force will destroy the forces of none other than Prussia, Russia, and the combined forces of Austria with even a little bit of Ottoman Empire forces in there as well. Now the Austerlitz battle though, like I said, shows us that Napoleon is almost undefeatable on land between these moments, right? And what we're going to also see as major effects of the Napoleonic Wars is going to be these following four things, right? You're going to see the spread of revolutionary ideas, right? Because the French Revolution, as it's beginning to spread all over the continent, is going to be taking those revolutionary ideas with them, right? The equality of all men, the, the like destruction of the classes, maybe also the idea of getting rid of feudalism is going to be spreading as well, and Enlightenment ideas are spreading along with him, okay? Now, the destruction of the Holy Roman Empire is going to happen as well, and that was a really, really big thing because remember, we talked about how the Holy Roman Empire had just kind of been limping along ever since the 30 years war. The Franco-German rivalry is a big one though too, but we're going to talk about that in class because it takes a little bit of explaining. And then also the creation of nation states, which we're going to talk about in class because it's going to take a little bit of explaining. But the big thing about it, those are the major effects right there. And we're leaving you off on an era of Napoleon before his big mistakes that will actually lead to the crumbling of his empire. But I'll talk to y'all.